pleased to be here on this birthday occasion. And I hope you'll allow this uh, yes, to so um, I very much appreciate your having done what I've certainly failed to do, which is to uh, convince um, some of the sceptical, and perhaps it's right to say, philistine culture value of abstract thought. Um, I'm also very pleased to sort of, in some sense, wind up the day, because they started with um, Lou Conway, and I suppose as well as thanking you at this more general level, I should thank you for having passed Lou Conway in my direction, <laughs> a matter of great profit to me. Uh, so I'm going to say something about the land calculus in a way that I've been trying to say for time. Uh, I'm going to say it in such a way as I hope to support some aspects of the idea of diagrams, but I'm not very good with diagrams, so I ended up drawing fewer than I expected. So I'll start just by saying something about algebraic theories. So an algebraic theory here is a sophisticated, more than the sort of category theoretic explanation of what a universal algebraist would call an abstract claim. Um, these things, the TNs, the terms of type N, this is substitution. There's the stuff that you'd expect for an algebraic theory, and it's bound up in a, in a categorical definition. And you'll be used to algebraic theories of all kinds that come from, as it were, algebra in maths courses, rings and groups and things like this. But for this it's useful just to bear in mind that there's always a source of algebraic theories for any object in a category with products. It has an algebraic theory, which is the algebraic theory of its endomorphisms. That's what I'm probably going to call it. So that's just a little bit of background there. So if you've got an algebraic theory, one thing you are sure to have is the category of T algebras. And the T algebra can't kind of the shape, this shape of stuff happens all the time, right? So the T algebra is something in which there are the action of these terms of them. I'm leaving out all the, you know, it's got to satisfy some associativity properties, blah, 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 okay? What you can see immediately if you could have held the previous slide in your head is that the Tn is just evidently a T algebra, and actually it's the free T algebra on N generators. You'd expect, again, that's terribly intuitive from a kind of concrete sense of algebraic theories. And I just mention, because this will happen at the very last slide, that there is always an algebraic, for any algebra, there's always an algebraic theory of extensions of, of that algebra, um, which you uh, can formally construct using code products and things like that. Okay, so maybe a less traditional in a course on uh, universal algebra or something is the existence of the category of pre sheaves of algebraic theory. <coughs> so if you're in the operad community, you call these things modules, which is a very misleading terminology. So I determinedly say pre sheaves. So you may not have seen this before. So you look at it and you see that in some sense in the previous thing T was here and A was here and it, as T was acting on one side and here T is acting on the X ends on the other side. That's all that's happening. Think of it. Um, what do I want to say about it? Well, perhaps, uh, I mean perhaps in a kind of spirit of gen generosity I'd say that if you knew what the Levia theory was that corresponded to this algebraic theory, it would be the same as pre sheaves on that, that Levia theory too. It's got, evidently, a universal object in here. If I put T for X, I get something. So there is a universal object. And in this context, the Yaneda lemma 
has a rather kind of strikingly uh, kind of intellectually large form. Because what it, you can see it as saying is that actually the theory of this universal object is the theory you first started with. That is a form, that's a sophisticated form of the Amazing and sitting there. And then because we're going to need it, next slide, or, or two slides later or something like that, I notice that it's an old form which I associate with the beer. I couldn't give you a reference for it. But in, in this situation, the function space U arrows U has a very simple representation. You'll see, if, if you know the, the work of, um, you'll see this thing in sort of your work with Gordon and things on uh, binding and this, that, and the other. I mean, this sort of phenomenon happens there too. Um, okay, so that's probably enough on that. I once found a paper by Andreas Blas on this, so that's a reference. I see. I mean, it's, it's a trivial calculation, so that the question is, why does it matter, perhaps? <laughs> um, okay, so now I'm going to introduce definition. And I can't, I can't, I haven't found a better term, and I apologise because I'm going to say that something's a lambda theorem that nobody thinks is a lambda theorem. Okay. So this is what a lambda theorem is. So lambda theory is a semi-closed algebraic theorem. So it's an algebraic theory, L, so you see. And <coughs> Ln plus 1 is a retract of Ln for all n in a natural and respecting composition way. And what's this got to do with the lambda calculus? Well, it's terribly simple. The Ln to Ln plus 1 is the operation of taking something or other and applying it to what is the new free variable floating in there. And in the opposite direction, it's just lambda abstraction. <coughs> so, uh, though you've never seen it before, <coughs> um, I mean, you ought to believe that if you'd seen it before, it would be completely obvious to you how in any structure <coughs> you could uh, interpret terms of lambda calculus or terms of lambda calculus extended by blah, 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 if you happen to have some blah, blah, blah. Um, and in f uh, so here, here is a point that I want to, to make. In fact, there's no other way to interpret terms of the lambda calculus because terms of the lambda calculus are defined by saying that it's a term in such and such number of free variables. And the whole point about lambda abstraction is that it changes the number of free variables. So you can't do <laughs> the lambda calculus as if it were algebra in the original sense. You have to do it in this sense, really. I, I say there's almost no other way to think about this. And what is then the case is that if you take the lambda calculus in its traditional sense, so that lambda n is the terms of the lambda calculus in up to n free variables, so to speak, factored out by beta, then that is the initial one of these. The collection of all of these with the, the natural maps preserving this absolutely essential piece of structure, that's not a property, that's a piece of structure, that thing is inevitably a representable category, and that thing is initial in it, but actually we'll see that it's more than a definitely find out the category. So that is the that is so so I tried in this to, to be careful because there are all sorts of stuff in the literature, what's a lambda algebra or a lambda model. And this is this is, as it were, what an interpretation of the lambda calculus is. <laughs> So, I mean, I can talk at you very crossly for periods of time saying it's got to be like this and other ways of thinking are silly. Um, but it's perhaps to a kind of, that's a bit bad tempered really. So instead of doing that, I'm going to try and show you that actually this theory works amazingly well. That was after a quick sanity check for myself. Yep. The, the, the fact that the retracts preserve our composition preserving that's essentially building in the substitution yes. lemma as well. Yes. So exactly. So. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So, <coughs> so categorical models, supposing you've got so 
this is, as it were, a Scots insight. Suppose you've got a, a retrack you, you, you in a category. I've said with products just to be fancy, so to speak, that's the function of space here. Then it's automatically the case that this is lambda theory in a canonical way. So when you have that problem, you have an automatic lambda theory. And what's more, all that stuff faffing around with algebraic theory was simply designed, in some sense, to show this. There's a representation theory. So if I take a lambda theory, I look in its category of pre-sheaves, that generic object actually has its function space of each track that it's in. And the innate isomorphism says that the, theory, the lambda theory of this, which includes the retract information, is just the theory of the first order. Okay. So uh, in some sense, part of the old classic picture of this is just this representation theorem. And what I want you to, to those of you who, are, who know the, the literature, the thing to understand is that what I've just done is part of something which it's traditional to do with a huge amount of lambda calculus calculations in categories of retracts. And in this lecture, there will be almost no calculations with lambda terms, whatever. And I certainly haven't had any yet. So here's another theorem, which, as it were, requires uh, as it were, one trivial lambda calculus calculation to, to uh, confirm something or other. So I call this the Scott-Taylor theorem. So the right way to think is this category of pre-sheaves is kind of fundamental to everything. The right way to think is that you take that, and in every slice over it, you can, can consider the category of retracts of this thing. And that index category has pi's and sigma's along the fibred maps that come from that. That's to say, the maps from such and such a retract down to the base. And it's a corollary of that, which is a theorem in Paul Taylor's thesis, that the category of retracts, of course, see, this is the category of retracts of my notion of what a model of the lambda calculus. Is not the stand, any standard one, but it's just immediate that the category of retracts is relatively Cartesian closed, and so, as it were, the Scott theorem, in some sense, the Scott theorem, that the category of retracts is Cartesian closed is just a consequence of that. Right. So, what about, as it were, more traditional notions? So, Here's a notion which I think it's, I mean, it's worth kind of taking seriously. So, lambda is the initial lambda theory. Okay. That was all that syntax from the lambda calculus. It's a theory, and so it has algebras. An algebra for such a thing is a set, A, and for every, so to speak, equivalence class of terms with n3 variables in it and n tuple, an interpretation of that in that, with the obvious conditions that the lambda calculus makes sense upon it. In other words, when you substitute things in, they make sense. So this notion is equivalent to the classical lambda calculus notion of lambda algebra. The classical lambda algebra notion has some sort of Made attempt to do some inductive definition in it, which doesn't really make any sense. But, but this is this is the same thing as this. So this is a really clean notion of the lambda algebra. On the other hand, the point of the talk, in some sense, is that you're never going to be able directly to show that a typical semantic thing is such a thing, because to do that, you've got to show that it's got these things and that all these substitutions of lambda terms and lambda terms work. And that's a huge amount of hidden induction, and the hidden induction involves terms with three variables in them. So there's no hope of, as it were, this being the primary notion. On the other hand, whenever I've got a lambda theory in the previous sense, its initial algebra, the L0, free on no, no generators, because there's a map from here to here, is automatically inherits the structure of a lambda algebra. 
So there's a way of going from lambda theories to lambda algebras. Okay. So far, so good. The hard thing is to go in the other direction. So now I'll sketch the other direction. So the outline of the other direction is this. I get a lambda algebra, about which you notice I don't know a huge amount beyond just the fact that I can interpret a few lambda terms over here. Out of it, I construct... Now, here I'm really concerned about terminology, because the person who really thought about this very hard was Carl Coyman's in the thesis he wrote on the Henk Barendrecht's um, direction. You get something... You certainly get a mon monoid. Out of the monoid, well, for a monoid, you take the ordinary category of pre sheaves on the monoid. I call that PA, which is PA1, which is a monoid. And you can find an object of this kind in that mon monoid. In fact, the universal object is of this kind. Now we've got a good object in this category, and so we take its endomorphism theory, and that's lambda theory. So from a lambda algebra, I go to a corresponding lambda theory. And I make a remark that the functoriality of this process is not completely trivial. You think that it's kind of natural, but actually, at least there are at least two subtleties that sit in this, including <coughs> some questions about um, the fact that certain left column extensions preserve products. So that's the <laughs> outline of a of, a, of a going back. And I want to say just a little about some part of that outline, which is something about the monoid and the pre sheaves on it, and some facts, and then I've got a few little diagrams to draw. So, the monoid comes from the, <coughs> from the often unrecognized most important combinator in the lambda calculus, which is this recognized to be the most important combinator in the land calculus combinator. But of course it has some history which people will know of can figure it out. So the monoid is the set of things in A which are functional. That's what that says. And it has a unit and it has a composition, which is land like that. And the universal object in what I'm calling the category pre sheaves on this thing is just this A1 with composition, so to speak, on the right. And here is A2, which is it's nice to define it so that it's just happening now inside the monoid. This is quite kind of cute to me. Coinlands is kind of spirit. It's the set of D such that when composed with this thing here, which is an idempotent, you get D. So firstly, it is a retract of A1. And it is the set of D which are two ways functional. And it's got a right adjoint, it's got a right action by composition here, so that actually it's clear that this is a, a retraction in P of A. And the basic fact the critical thing here is that this is the only basic fact you need to know, is that A2 is isomorphic to U to U. So if you know the sort of traditions, either Scott or the Baron Rick books and so on, the second tradition and so on of this, of this stuff, you do a lot of calculations with lots and lots of retracts. You don't need to do any calculations with lots and lots of retracts. There's only one retract that matters, it's this one. And as soon as you've got it, all the other retracts just happen by category theory. There's, not, there's nothing else that's needed. So why is that? Well, you can just write, I mean, in fact, previously I've just written down the, the land terms of this. But so this is a kind of present for Samson, is to try and do this diagrammatically. So the key point is this. By general category theory, u to the u will have this as underlying set and with an action which I won't tell you about because we're all tired and stuff. Um, and
And it's, this means equivariant maps from here to here. So I've written A, B, and C for things in U. And equivariant, so do you, do you see, this is a kind of linear logic -y notation, right? These things are put inside this box, and it's got its own things out so that everything's been bound. That's what means it's a kind of function like this. Right? But it has the property that if you compose it with C on this end, it's the same as popping the Cs inside. That's what the equivariance of that is. It's a diagrammatic thing. And the basic fact is that any phi of that kind is uniquely of the form AB goes to this lambda term, which I'll explain kind of in a moment, um, for a unique DNA term. Which I'm going to sort of half prove. So, in order to understand the half-proof, you have to understand what the algebra... So, Koyman's actually... I, I, it would be very interesting to write a paper about this, because Koyman's has a kind of picture of what the Cartesian closed monoids are. And this is completely different, with a different choice of primitives, in which you can't see any function spaces at all. So, the point is this. That that you've got algebraic structure on all this stuff I've given so far, which is this. There's composition of the basic things in the monoid. There's this thing, which is a composition of a something of, of arity 2 with things of arity 1, which is this lambda term here, which I've sort of drawn a picture of, the flow diagram. In here comes the x. It goes through an a and a b and pops into the d, so to speak. Um, this is very much sort of, you know, in the spirit of all these diagrams that Oxford is now very famous for. Uh, uh, A1 cross A2 to A2 is kind of comparatively simple. And the subtle, the most interesting one sometimes is A2 cross A2 squared A2, which is, take something with two variables, bundle them in and all kinds of stuff. What you're seeing there is an absolutely tiny fragment of an algebraic theorem. You're seeing it at, as it were, the one and two places and nothing else. And there are some units and associative laws which are the restriction of the laws for algebraic <coughs> theories to those things, which I've just got writing out here, and they're kind of obvious. Here is the two projections, there's the identity, traditional land terms in this case. And the critical fact about the lambda calculus that makes it all work is incredibly simple. It's that there are the following three things. This thing in A1, this thing in A1, this thing in A2, it's P2. It is, for goodness sake, the first, as it were, of a whole set of combinators that are used to do Burns theory. Really, this is a, that, that's, that's, as it were, one of the many, yes, it, just any number of extensions of that are used to use verbs here. And that's the only, those are the equations, those are the non-trivial equations. In other words, that they compose to produce those two projections. And that's the lambda calculus calculations in some sense, the only ones we need. So, I'm going to put a computation here. Now, it doesn't work terribly well, I'm afraid. It's the best I could do. So, here is the operation. If I've got phi, which is this box, the operation of taking phi to the corresponding d puts the p and q inside this and puts the p2, this Burm combinator, outside the back. And that's it. And here is me trying to show you that it works this one way around. So I put this in and I plug an a and b in. And now that stuff here is just a one-to-one -one thing, right? And so I'm allowed to use that excellent notion of uh, equivariance. So I bung it in to here, and that has the profitable advantage that P gets into contact with P2, and Q gets into contact with P2. And so I get true and false of these things here, and I just get A and B. So it's a kind of... If you write out the lambda calculus, which is what I've previously been doing, it looks considerably hard, but actually when you do it in this diagrammatic kind of way, which is so famous here, it really is almost childish. J 
just two quick points. A delicate point is this. If you start with a, what I'm calling land theory, go and take land algebra and find this thing, then the fact that those two theories are isomorphic, you know, I mean, this is H.J. Thorne in a way, there's an absolutely, as it were, there is a chosen isomorphism which comes here, which is natural in everything in sight. That's, that's trivial by category theory. That's sort of Marita equivalence. On the other hand, if you start with an A, form that theory, and go back, this is kind of, I still find this counterintuitive, and go back and find the corresponding algebra. It is not so easy to show that that's an isomorphism. It is actually quite a subtle thing. Um, and I won't say anything more about Discretion is better than anything else, I think. Um, so I just close with what I think of as the fundamental theorem of the Lamb calculus, which sort of ties right back to something that we were saying before. So these two operations give an equivalence between the lambda theories and lambda algebras. And since these lambda algebras are the traditional lambda algebras, this says that this kind of sophisticated theory picture is just the same as the traditional picture. What I would say is <coughs> this fundamental theory, it's in a such a way that <coughs> every lambda theory in this sense is isomorphic <coughs> to this theory. That is to say the theory of lambda algebras extending the initial lambda algebra of it. Now, quite a lot is packed into that because stuff that's in L is all L algebra maps. And this says that after all, it's just enough to be lambda algebra maps. For example. But that equivalence, it's, I, I just say, why, why is this the fundamental theorem? Well, because fundamental theorems aren't supposed to be up into the stratosphere of the subject or anything like that. They're just supposed to lay the bases. And this equivalence of the thing that you can get your handle on with some notion of definite algebraic structure, I mean, I think it deserves to be thought of as the basic fact about lambda calculus. But actually, lambda algebras are right in one sense, but only once you see this picture. Okay, so that's it. Somebody gives you something. 
that the, the critical thing is this. If you get something and all you know is the application, it tells you absolutely nothing. I mean, in, in certain cases where you've got enough extensionality, it tells you quite a bit. But ordinarily, it tells you nothing about the lambda abstraction. The lambda abstraction in, in all these essentially intentional models is a real other piece of structure. It's a chosen code for the thing that does such and such. I agree it's chosen, but I mean it's beguilingly almost trivial in game models because it just relies on some underlying, just, it's just associativity. Yes, there. yes, yes. But that's, that relies on the fact that actually the picture of what happens in game models already spells out all this stuff. So the, the, the side remark which you made, uh, <coughs> modulo tail, Paul Taylor's observation that, that the structure that you're getting is relative Cartesian closed, you're, you're saying that in this f first beta only fragment of lambda calculus you have a canonical dependent type theory of, of some sort and then after that you started releasing slowly eta rule in, in, into A1 so there is, there is even there's even extensional. So, what kind of what kind of dependent type theory is this? Um, in 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 general, there's rather little that you can say about it because you don't really have it. I mean, if you're just in the land calc, this is not obvious what you can do about identity types. So, it's not. A <coughs> but in domain models or something like that, I mean, that says it were the domain model for type theory. And and what happens with 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 these with these relative maps uh, when you rel when you when you when you restrict to these where where eta is satisfied and this eta oh i mean e e e i mean i, I may, may have missed eta eta really has nothing eta has nothing eta almost only confuses in, mm. in this, this discussion um, uh, it's an optional extra um, but that, and it's be best to do the whole theory without eta but A1 are those that happen to satisfy no, Well, eta. They, they satisfy that bit of eta there, but they don't, as it were, indefinitely. You know, after all, A2 satisfies general. So, so, so you know, it's, it's, it's more subtle than that. Yes. Other questions? Okay, let's thank uh, Martin again. Okay, so that's it for today, and Samsung Fest will resume tomorrow at half past nine.